He was a troubled kid in and out of jail. When his daddy said, this is the last time I'll pay bail. Then he enlisted in the army and they sent him to Iraq. He was a different man when he came back. Some people said the army must have whipped you into shape. But he said that's not the reason that I've changed. Somebody died.
may be glad for the love of God. Isn't that a wonderful thing? Let's sing about God's love. It's our theme. God is love. God is love. church this morning 463 when the roll is called up yonder i'll be there when the lord comes back hope that heaven is your home right here we go when the trumpet of the lord shall sound and time shall be no more and the morning breaks eternal bright and fair when the same number shall gather over on the other shore shall send his angels with a great sound of trumpets and they shall gather together his elect from the four winds from one end of heaven to the other and the bible talks about your names being written in the lamb's book of life we get to school in the morning and they take attendance they read the role who's here and who's not you need to know that your name is written there and that heaven is your home ready here we go verse two all that bright and cloudless morning when the day church this morning good to be in church this morning amen all right I look back to see if the choir was singing Melinda my daughter's up here she had a big yawn going with her hand right up to her mouth I just stopped in the middle of the choir and just looked at her like what is that it's bad when your dad's the preacher right one of the preachers and uh, it's worse when your uncle's a preacher your grandfather's a preacher Anyway, it's good to be in church. Tell the person next to you right now, say, it's good to be in church. Just tell them that. They need to hear that, right? Good to be in church. And we got much to pray about, and I uh, want to be praying. I just gave a quick call to Joe Hernandez, and Joe's watching online, been fighting cancer, and uh, he's got some scans tomorrow, not feeling well. He's in a lot of pain, and uh, he and his family are watching. So we got to pray for Joe that God would give him grace, all right? How many of you will try to especially remember Joe and the fact that he's got these scans tomorrow? Appreciate you doing that. Others in our church dealing with cancer, other things. People carrying burdens, but God's the great burden bearer. And so we're trusting him with that. 
I want you to pray this coming Tuesday. We will be in Third Circuit Federal Appeals Court, and our case has come up. It's not long. It's 30 minutes. Each side gets 15 minutes, and much of the work's already done in advance with all the writing of all the uh, things pertaining to arguments, and the judge will, judges, three-judge panel will look at all of that, and then probably be about a month at least before we get results. I hate that. Uh, <laughs> And the reason this is all going on, because in May of 2020, when we opened the church, Pastor Reese, myself, Pastor Clark, Pastor Reese is pastor of Bible Baptist over here in West Berlin, we were ticketed for opening the church five times. We were ticketed. And so there's something called the First Amendment. And um, last time I checked, it was still in the Constitution. If we were in China, we don't have the First Amendment, but freedom isn't free, and people paid a price to give us the freedom we have, so we're trying to still fight for our freedom. Amen. The ultimate goal is so that uh, a governor cannot, by uh, executive order, just decide the church is non-essential, has to be shut, while the liquor store and the pot store is still open. Am I being direct? Is everybody getting what we're saying here? All right, and that's all happened, so we're not... Uh, we're not getting rich off of this, anything like that it has nothing to do with money, it has everything to do with principle and freedom. And uh, we don't want a governor in the future who decides, for instance, you know, monkeypox would be a good reason to shut Solid Rock down. No, no, and no. Okay, why? Because, quote, it is our firmly held religious conviction that for us to not attend church, it would be sin. We have to come as a matter of conscience. And that's something that's very big to us. And so some church, our church or another, ultimately needs to get to the Supreme Court and to be able to get a settled decision, case law, that would say that can't happen again. And so we're pushing towards that. Again, God is completely in control. Our case was rendered moot. So our appeal is to want to win and not be uh, having it rendered moot any longer so that we could actually go to trial on this thing. Again, the goal is to get it settled in our country again, because there's whatever numbers of people that would love to shut down all the churches and forever. That can't be, right? That's why you're in church, and that's why we've been in this. So it's been going on a long time. Tuesday morning at 10, we need you to pray. Tonight we'll have a special prayer meeting. We'll bring everybody in, we'll explain a little bit more to the kids, and I want them praying too, but we'll, we'll, we'll have an extended prayer time uh, there. Um, Brother Seth Kraus is with us, and he is one of our lawyers from the Christian Law Association. I'm going to have you come lead us in prayer, Seth, if you would, please. And I appreciate this. He's flown in. He'll be in our church this morning and Pastor Reese's tomorrow. And these men and ladies from CLA have been working diligently, diligently. You, I mean, just this has been going on for two years now and just pour themselves into this. Brother Seth's a good man and knows his stuff, and he has his family. And it touches my heart that he's here with us. And to help us, Pastor Clark and I will be, Pastor Reese will be consulting with the lawyers tomorrow, and then uh, Tuesday we'll be there in Philadelphia. So it's a big thing, and uh, God's in control. Whatever God decides, ultimately, is how this thing's going to roll. But uh, I appreciate uh, the, the lawyers who have helped us. Brian Tome is a dear friend, and I want you to pray especially for him. Uh, and in this situation, and people that have just gotten behind our situation, and, and we need uh, some help from the Lord. God's blessing on the church, Joe, if you remember Joe, and then the court situation, and then just for the Lord's presence to be here. Isn't it good to be in church? I keep saying that. I want you to be convinced. If you're our guest, make yourself at home. We're not here to put on a performance. We're here to hear from God in our hearts and here today. All right, Brother Seth, great to have you. Please lead us in prayer. Appreciate it, man. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for today. Uh, what a great day so far, a great day to be in church. Uh, we pray for Joe. Uh, you know his situation. We just pray that you would heal him and be with him. Uh, we pray for this court hearing on Tuesday that you would go before us and, and work on the judges' hearts and minds. Uh, we pray for the service today. Uh, if there's anyone here that's not saved, that they uh, trust you this morning. And we pray for the preaching. We love you, Jesus. Amen. Amen. Thank you. You may be seated. Appreciate that. We have music camp this week. Man, that was a blessing. We had 104, 105, something like that, campers, and they were here, and uh, our 
staff and others that were outside of our staff that came as instructors did a phenomenal job and thank you to everybody that came on Thursday night and supported the young people they did a phenomenal job the Lord just helped them and it honored God uh, after just three and a half days I couldn't believe what all they were able to sing and play here on Thursday night. if you for some reason missed it I encourage you to go to our website watch it it's worth the watch and it was a great blessing. And here's the goal. We want young people to be praising the Lord through uh, song and, and through instrumental. And it was a great thing. So thank you for everybody who prayed and some of you that paid and were part of that. And we're just thrilled about it. I love it when young people feel like or when you feel like and how we feel like, man, we just can't help but sing because of the goodness of God. The goodness of God, God's love to us, puts a song in our heart. And that's a great feeling when it's just overflowing.
Amen. I hope you can sing. They talk about the song of the redeemed. We're going to sing that now. 311, 311 in your books. Let's stand together. Redeemed, how I love to proclaim it. Redeemed by the blood of the Lamb. Sing it out. Redeemed, how I love to proclaim it. Notice in those words we sang, I sing for I cannot be silent. I thought, well, that tied right in with the choir song, right? How can I help? How can I keep from singing? So thank the Lord for that. If you're our guest, we appreciate you being here. And not sure how you heard about us, but thanks for coming. And we'd like to give you a response card, ask you to fill that out. And when you leave, there'll be ushers at the door. You can hand it to one of the ushers. I'm not going to make you stand or give a speech or anything, but if you're here today for the first time or here just once in a while, would you raise your hand just high enough where the fellows can find you? They're going to go through and give you one of these cards. And again, if you'd fill it out and then just hand it to an usher as you leave, we would appreciate that. It's good to have everybody in church today. Appreciate it. Wonderful, wonderful. Trying to take care of everybody. Good, 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 good. We're going to pray for our offering. If you'd like to give, you can give online. Or you can give it to an usher as you leave. Some folks mail it in and others uh, choose to bring it by the church. We're going to do something that it's not the first time we've done it. Many years we've uh, post summit needed to continue to pay for the summit. And this year costs were up significantly. Hotel rooms, uh, like everything else, hotel rooms have been exorbitant and um, the food bill and on and on and on. And with the crowd of people we have. So... Um, we're going to the next two weeks, and I know whatever numbers of you have pledged to sponsor pastors, I'm not twisting anybody's arm. I don't say that with any sarcasm. Uh, this would be for anybody who wants to be involved, but we need to pay uh, what's left on the summit, which comes to about $38,500, which is a lot of money, and we know that. The summit is our investment in the Northeast. So some churches choose to support missions, we do, Absolutely. Um, there's other things that we've done in the past, building projects. The summit is an ongoing every year investment in the pastors who come from all the different states and their families and the people they bring with them from their churches. And the idea would be this. Dr. Gibbs told me years ago, we either reach the Northeast or we lose the country. That's a strong statement. We either reach the Northeast or we lose the country. And right now, um, we have a lot of Northeast churches that are without a pastor. Uh, we have a young man that's out from our church today preaching at a church that's very soon going to be without a pastor. We have another church that Pastor Clark 
I spoke with somebody recently and that church is going to be without a pastor. And so we're trying to support people and help them. And there's great expense in it. We're aware of that. Um, so the next two weeks in particular, as the Lord leads, whoever wants to give in that offering, um, you can give online, you can give by envelope, but mark it for the summit. And um, that's something we're looking to do. We have our regular expenses, our tithes and offerings as normal. But if anybody and whatever numbers of folks that are willing to go the extra mile with it, that's something we like to take care of just as soon as possible. So the next two weeks in particular, we're going to emphasize that. The summit value, how do you put a price tag on? I had a pastor Thursday night. His kids were here for music camp. He said to me, he said, Brother Child, we came here 10 years ago for the first time. He said, we were so discouraged and to the point of just barely getting along as a pastor. He said, and we walked in the doors and he mentioned one man in particular that reached out and then just in general. And he said, the love here and for my family, he said, it was just, it was transformational and giving them the strength to keep on. He said, at that time, we probably had 15 people in our church. He said, we're running over 100 people now. And 10 years later, they come every year. He said, if you ask my kids right now, he said, without me even being there, he said, if you just asked them, um, would you rather go to the summit or would you rather go to Disney World? They'd all say the summit. He said, and we've been to Disney World. He said, uh, that was his statement on it. And, and here's where that's that investment. Again, this next group of young people being raised up in Bible-believing churches in the Northeast I thank God that by God's grace, God's allowed us to have a church that can do what it's doing and supporting these men and ladies and their families from all these different churches and the people there. So again, we're aware of the expense of it and it's not the first time we've done offerings after the summit to take care of things. Just this year, it's a little bit more because of what's going on in the country and it's affected everything that we did here. So you pray about it and give as the Lord leads you. Let's go to the Lord in prayer right now. Father, I pray you bless all our friends in ministry across this country and around the world. We pray for our missionaries. We pray for our Northeast friends in particular. Father, I pray for these churches that don't have a pastor. And Lord, I pray that you would meet their needs and take care of them. Lord, I, I pray for Jonah preaching at a church here this morning, that you'd give him a great service, help him to be a blessing. Lord, I pray that you would meet the needs of our people. And Lord, it's expensive living in this state and our people are working hard. And they're supporting your work. And God, I pray you would bless them and reward them for it. And God, I pray for anyone here that's out of a job, that you give them the job they need. Some need a better job. Some are looking for housing, a new vehicle, whatever they need. I pray you take care of them. Bless all those who are faithful in giving. Lord, I do pray about the summit costs. Lord, I pray that you supply the need. Lord, you've always done that for us. I pray you do it again this year. And Lord, I pray that you would... Help us as a church. Lord, we don't want to just pay the bills. We want to take new ground. And God, I pray you'd enable that. I pray you do that for us. Thanks for how good you've been. Lord, we can never give back enough. You've been so amazingly good to us. And we want to thank you for it. And we pray in Christ's precious and holy and wonderful name. Amen. I'm going to have a song about amazing. I, didn't, I thought as I prayed that, I thought that's a word from the Lord. This is amazing Travis Clark and his unamazing father. I'm only kidding. That was not kind. Aren't you glad we serve an amazing God? Absolutely. Listen to this song. Let it encourage you. From nothing, you spoke everything. In a manger, the shepherds came to see. Miracles and wonders, you walked upon the waters. Who is this man named Jesus? All men came to see. Unstoppable, you never lost a battle. Magnificent, the ruler of all days. Lord, your power is strong enough. There are thousands of ways to say, Lord, you're amazing. From the crowds to alone in the garden, from Hosanna to knocking your name, nailed to Thank you. 
is amazing we'll stand together 485 this world is not my home brother Charlie said the unamazing Michael and I thought I was up here leading singing earlier and I missed the first words to the song life's getting tricky because as my head moves back I can see and then I can't see and then I can see and then I can't see and I'm thinking this is like a game up here if I hold still or where I'm at on this pulpit here I can either see or not how many of you are, are, are fighting the same thing in your life I walked down the hallway I saw brother Keith limping I said what'd you do he said I kicked a soccer ball and I'm thinking it was just yesterday and I was going to see him play up at Holy Family College and King's College and he's this star and now he can't kick a ball. And I'm thinking this aging process happens more quickly than what I thought. The vapor, you know, it's reality. But anyway, I'm alive, as unamazing as it is. It makes me think of this song, this world is not my home. If you know Christ is your savior, hey, it's only gonna get better. And life's good, I love life. But uh, as we go through this world, I thank God that we've got a place called heaven. We're just pilgrims and strangers passing through. Let's sing it out, ready? 485, this world the world is not my home, I'm just a passing through. My treasures are laid up somewhere beyond the blue. The angels beckon me from heaven's open door. And I can't feel at home in this world anymore. Oh Lord, you know I have no friend like you. If heaven's not my home, then Lord, what will I do? me from heaven's open door and I can't feel at home in this world anymore I thought earlier this morning I'm going to say it this service I didn't last time I, we're hearing this I thought about Catherine now if you don't know who Catherine is you missed out on a blessing but how many of you know who I'm talking about Catherine she Catherine got bouncing on this song she liked it she was six foot two I think six two six three she's in the choir but this one she clapped a little bit on this one in fact she clapped a lot of it on it so and Catherine's watching from heaven today I don't want to disappoint her and, and let her down so we're gonna clap on that chorus or just clap through the whole verse I don't care let's sing here we go there are the orchestra I said play it happy play it happy all right so they're gonna play it through I want you to turn to somebody near you next to you tell them the first person after Jesus that you want to meet in heaven and why tell somebody next to you the first person after Jesus that you want to meet in heaven and why tell somebody come on you thinking about it
quit singing this morning and you may be seated. It's good to be alive. Good to start church. Start your week out in church and that's a great decision. Thank God for that. What a blessing it is. You know, we get to hear about God at church and we get to pray at church, but we don't have to wait until church to get to talk to God every day of our lives. We can wake up. We have an advocate, the Father, who goes in our behalf, right, to the Father, Jesus Christ, ever living to make intercession for us. And what a privilege it is to spend each day with the Lord. And uh, I just thank God for that. This world's going crazy, but we get to have that stable time walking with God and in His Word and on our knees every day. What a privilege it is to walk with the Lord. a place I was made to fill. I find amazing grace when I'm found within His will. And He's reserved a sacred place where we can spend the day. And He's waiting there for me. And every day I'm amazed that God would spend the day with me. I'm overwhelmed by His grace that He would feel such love for me. To Him I'm worth saving and my heart is craving. and understand His ways. Every day, in every way, I'm amazed. In my heart, there's a place that only God can fill. Grace with the blood that Jesus spilled, and He invites me to a place where we can spend the day. Vanessa, come here for a minute. Come here for a second. I'm going to embarrass you. That's okay. 
I didn't plan to do this. Come on out here. Come on out here. This is my daughter, if you didn't know. This is my middle daughter. This is Jeffrey Weaver's wife. Okay. Um, how are you doing? And she's going to have a baby. Okay. And we knew about that. We told the church. Um, but I, in the context of what I'm going to preach here this morning, I, I want to reference the idea of family. Okay. And family. Hello. Do January 28th, okay? So um, I don't know what it is yet. They do. I'm an anti-gender reveal, old school person. So they're deciding where they're going to break my heart and tell the whole world. But I think they're going to. And they know, I think you know already, don't you? Okay. I don't normally guess at that kind of stuff. I think it's a girl, but I don't know that stuff. So I, I, don't, I, don't, um, I don't predict people say, what do you think it is? It's whatever God wants you to have. All right? And that's how I've always looked at that. But the idea of family, okay, and again, Jeffrey's wife, my middle child, she has that syndrome in a big way for you middle child people, right? But the idea of a baby, a baby who, by the way, is a baby, okay, in case, we're, in case we got to worry about that. If you didn't know that, but that, that's what it is. Person, current state right now, okay? So anyway, um, I just... I want you to go over to the book of Hebrews 11 in your Bible, but since she was here, she's a good illustration for what we're talking about today in the context of family and family that will soon be with us and the importance of it. So we're in Hebrews chapter 11. Hebrews chapter 11. Hebrews chapter 11. Yes, sir. Hebrews chapter 11 in your Bible. And, and we're going to be looking there. Hebrews chapter 11. I'm glad for the Bible. Glad for the Word of God. Hebrews chapter 11. Appreciate everybody that came into the adult Bible classes this morning. And your teens being in your teen class. And we had a, a good time in our class today. Um, when I say good time, it doesn't mean we ran the aisles, but it was more... Uh, the Lord tore me up, so I'm, I appreciate the Word of God. Let's pray. Father, there's a lot of people here with a lot of burdens, and I pray your Holy Spirit right now would lift the burden and allow people to concentrate. And Lord, I pray for anyone who doesn't feel well that you give them the strength that they need. And God, I pray for our folks that are sick at home, watching online for whatever reason, God, that you'd give them grace with their illnesses. Lord, I pray you be with the Spanish service. Help Brother Carlos as he preaches. God, I pray for our deaf service. Help Brother Chris as he preaches. Lord, I pray for the three junior churches that you'd bless them. Bless the young kids' classes, nursery. Bless the ladies, teen girls, watching the little ones. Lord, I pray you be a Bible-believing preachers today all around the world. I pray that you'd fill them with the Holy Spirit. Lord, I pray if there's even one person in this room who's not saved, that they would see their need for Christ. And God, I pray they get saved today. And for all of us who are saved, I pray you'd stir us to be the Christians we need to be. And we pray in Christ's precious and holy and wonderful name. Amen. Hebrews chapter 11 and verse 7. Hebrews 11, 7. By faith, Noah, who's our man for the day? Noah, right? By faith, Noah, being warned of God of things not seen as yet, moved with fear, prepared an ark to the saving of his house, by the which he condemned the world and became heir of the righteousness which is by faith. Noah cared about his family. Noah cared about his family. Noah wanted to see his family saved from the destruction that was to come, the judgment of God. And so we see in verse 7 that Noah prepared an ark and I want you to notice this, to the saving of his house. I'd like you to mark those words, the saving of his house. 
Noah prepared. He prepared. And it was important to him. You say his house, you're talking about the physical structure? No, nope, not talking about the physical structure. In Genesis chapter 6 and verse 18, the Bible gives us a description of Noah's house. It was both him and Mrs. Noah and his three sons, Shem, Ham, Japheth. And each of them had their wife. So you have Noah, his wife, his three sons, his three daughters-in-law. And so there was a core family group of eight people. Eight people in Noah's life, what we could call his people. You ever use that term, my people? They're, that's my people. Sometimes people say that's my tribe. Sometimes people say that's my family. Now, in particular, I want you to think today about your people. I want you to think about your family. It could be family extended. Maybe you're single, but you've got nieces, nephews. Maybe you're here in this local church and you don't really understand just how much you're influencing the next generation in this church. But in particular, I want you to think about your spouse. I want you to think about your children, your grandchildren. And however it is, God gives you a family group here. And I want you to notice about Noah that, again, he prepared. He built this ark to the saving of his house. Now, I want you to keep a marker in Hebrews 11. And you're going to need one more marker for Genesis 6. I don't know what you're, if you're really good with your hands and fingers, you could just do it that way. But go to Genesis chapter 6 there in your Bible. And we're going to jump back and forth roughly to that area of Genesis several times here in the message where it is the biblical account of Noah and his life. Why was Noah so interested in the saving of his house? What was the problem that his house would have to be saved? Well, in Genesis chapter 6 and verse 5, I'd like you to notice this verse. The Bible says, And God saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth. That doesn't mean great like they were doing a great job. It meant in the quantity, in the amount, and God saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth, and that, this is an amazing statement, and that every imagination, every imagination of the thoughts of his heart was only, was only evil, and notice how often, continually. Continually, man was wicked. And God was going to bring judgment on man for his wickedness. And he declared that it would be in 120 years, verse 3 in your book here, it says that. And the idea of God was going to bring judgment on mankind because man had grown increasingly wicked. Notice verse 6, and it repented the Lord that he had made man on the earth and it grieved him at his heart. So I want you to notice in verse 5, God saw. Let me remind you, God's not blind. God saw. God sees. He still sees because he's immutable. God's incapable of change. Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. So God saw then. God sees now. And it grieved him in his heart. You know, we can grieve God with our sin. That's how we grieve the Holy Spirit, by tolerating sin. And it's the idea of sadden. God was saddened by man and his behavior because their thoughts were only evil continually. And God said, I'm going to bring a judgment on man. In verse 7, here's the judgment. The Lord said, I will destroy man whom I have created from the face of the earth. Both man and beast and the creeping thing and the fowls of the air. For it repenteth me that I have made them. Wow. Strong. People in Noah's day living wickedly. And God says, I'm going to bring judgment. I'm going to extinguish man. Matthew chapter 24 in your Bible, please. Matthew 24. Again, keep a marker, Genesis 6, uh, Hebrews 11. But go to Matthew 24, a prophetic chapter in the word of God. The Lord talks here about great tribulation, false Christ, false prophets. Ultimately, the second coming is part of what's prophesied about. In verse 30, they shall see the Son of Man coming in the clouds of heaven 
with power and great glory. So Christ will come again with a second coming and he's going to come there to Jerusalem and be there and at the Mount of Olives and ultimately rule and reign from Jerusalem. Before the second coming of Christ, what's it going to be like? Well, notice verse 36, but of that day and hour knoweth no man, no, not the angels of heaven, but my father only. But here's some of what it's going to look like. But as the days of Noah were, so shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. For as in the days that were before the flood, they were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage until the day. Until the day that Noah entered into the ark and knew not until the flood came and took them all away so shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. If you don't know the story, God predicted and God said, stated, that there was going to be rain and a flood in Noah's day, and that was going to be how the judgment would come. But the people, they were just eating, drinking, marrying, giving in marriage, being consumed with evil continually. It was a wicked time, a wicked age to where God said... I'm going to judge them with this flood. And they didn't realize what was going to happen until God shut Noah in and then the judgment came. Now, Noah had preached about it, but they ignored his preaching. And people are going to just be doing what people do when Christ suddenly comes back again. But I believe when the Bible's describing like it was in the days of Noah, that's for a reason. It's for those of us living now to understand that just like Genesis 6, 5 described how the world was and what God saw and what God was going to do, that that's going to happen again. Now, it's not going to happen by flood, but it will happen by fire. That rainbow that the Sodomite crowd has tried to steal, I refuse to give over because the Bible calls it God's bow. My bow. It's the Lord's bow. Y'all put your seatbelt on and be okay. We're in church now. But that's how you understand you're being live streamed. I said it's God's bow. It doesn't belong to the sodomites. Amen. Preacher, that's right. Preacher, brother Charlie. I'm going to. Don't, don't shun away from God's bow. I, you know, I don't know if I have anything rainbow. I don't want people to get the wrong impression. It's God's bow. This is not in the notes, but I just feel the need to say it, including the fact some of you get nervous about it. It's God's bow. Amen. Don't be nervous. It belongs to him. He created the rainbow. And it's to say, hey, I'm not going to destroy man again with a flood. Now, we understand that the world's gone crazy. Our day, our age. I mentioned with Vanessa standing here the idea of abortion. We now murder babies in the womb from conception up till delivery and post. Life begins at conception. And murdering a baby in the womb is murder at any stage after conception. Amen. You say, what's the point? The point is, just because it's legalized in whatever states, including and especially in New Jersey, it's not okay with God. We're living in an age, we talked about in Sunday school, the adult Bible classes, Christ following, the idea of suffering for giving the gospel. There's people today, they're against what they would call Christofascism. And what they mean is, if you stand up for the Bible, you are a fascist and we need to get rid of you. Well, let God be true and every man a liar. We stand for the Bible. But we're living in an age where there is persecution in parts of the world and there's pressure in other parts of the world. And there's this, just like with the Tower of Babel, we're going to build a tower and go up to God. Man's pride is not changed. And those in the world today who are grouping together with the idea of a one world and a globalism and a one world government and a one world religion and a one world currency, and that's not conspiracy, that's Bible that we know that ultimately that's the end goals and even unsaved people know that today. So don't label me a conspiracist, but you can label me a biblicist. 
So here's the point, church family. Please hear me. You don't need to be nervous about what God said was going to happen. Now, how that impacts us in our day, and I cannot stand here and tell you, I know the rapture is going to come at the beginning of the tribulation, ultimately, the judgment seat of Christ for us in heaven, marriage, supper, the land, we come back with Christ, and the second coming of Christ. I don't have any prediction for exactly when that would be, but I do know this, much of the world today is living like it was in the day of Noah. So here's what I'm telling people. Because often people say, boy, you see this is going on and that's going on. And, and, and I'm, by the way, I'm not mocking. People send me stuff all the time. We have conversations and I understand it. But here's what I'm telling people. Here's what I'm telling people. You ready? Get your family on the ark. Everybody tracking? Get your family on the ark. Now, I believe there's an ark of safety for the current moment. And I believe for sure there's the idea of an ark of safety for all of eternity. Thank God for that. So the idea of getting your family on the ark, Noah was serious about the saving of his house. Question, are you? I mean, are, are you really serious about the saving of his house? We, well, we're big on safety sometimes. My daughter, Christiana, had put up some video thing that I saw last night about little Michael. And I noticed two things in particular. One scene, they were on a boat with him standing up. And I could see the way he's going in the background. I thought, well, glad he didn't jump. He did have on a light preserver. I saw another part of the scene and he's got his head out the window like a dog did. And it was not a car seat or a seat belt, but he was having a good time. Now, I was raised in the old school. My dad threw us in the back of the pickup and we bounced along sitting up on the wheel well. How many of you were in that ministry back in the day as a kid? So I'm not overly stressed about it, but I did notice. Why? Because culture has changed to where you have to wear a helmet when you ride a bike. We didn't ride a helmet. I had a, a ramp. I remember in Texas, we had some junky piece of bike and it had a banana seat. For those of you who remember what that was with the bar behind it. I remember making a ramp on wood going on a wagon and, and jumping kids that were there. I'm jumping over them. And I made my brother and sister the last two people in case I didn't clear. <laughs> I mean, remember growing up like that. And I did not have a helmet or a safety net or, or an airbag, nothing. And I'm still here. So I'm not against safety measures, but are you most concerned about the type of safety measures that Noah was serious about with the saving of his house? So here's a thought. Judgment is coming. And I don't know to what degree we'll experience that. As Americans, I believe we're under the judgment of God. I believe that. I'm not happy about it. We're resisting the idea of just being given over to all the things that this world's pushing for. But the thought would be this, please hear me, don't just assume everybody's on the ark. Make sure they're there. Make sure they're there. And be passionate about it. I don't know about you, but there's nothing that moves me more than the idea of getting my family, getting my people, getting my tribe on the ark. And for me, that extends out to this local church family and in particular, the next generation. I'm passionate about us investing like you are, like you are in the next generation and through the summit, through our own local church, through the music camp, through the Christian school, through the bus ministry. Say, boy, you got a lot of emphasis on those kids. Yes, and thank you very much because they matter to God and I want to see them have opportunity to live in a free country and a Bible-believing church and what was given to you and I by God's grace, you and I need to be consumed with providing a safe place for our next generation. And ultimately, you're bending on God for safety, both in this world and going into the next world. While trying to reach the whole world, I don't want to lose my own family. While you are traveling through, helping, and with everyone, don't lose your own family. Now, please hear me. Somebody here is already discouraged in the message. Because there's whatever percentage of people 
including if your child is prodigal or unsaved, you could be very discouraged right now. Don't be. Because God is still on the throne and prodigals can come home. And lost children who are now adults can get saved. And people can have their lives transformed and changed by the powerful grace of God. So you're still here and don't quit on what your family needs to be for God. Don't quit on it. Say, but child, you don't understand. I understand there's some eggs that can't be unscrambled. I, I get it, right? And there's whatever degree, a degree of regret, but you do still have now and you do still have who you have and, and don't quit on the thing and let's press toward the mark for the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. So, in talking about the saving of his house, saving of your house, the idea, one, care about their salvation, and two, care about their spiritual success. One, care about their salvation, and two, care about their spiritual success. People, boy, I tell you what, if my kid will get that education, they'll get that job, they'll be able to buy that house, and they'll be able to retire, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. I'm not against whatever you think is important in those areas, education, et cetera. But what's most important is that they would be spiritually successful. And don't let the world destroy you or destroy your people, your family. You say, but brother Tyler, there's some situations and I don't think this is going to change and I'm not, and I don't know if that's going to change. Then listen, with who you are at this point and with who you have at this point, you need to do God's will for you and your people. For you and your, are y'all listening please? I'm, I'm, I'm trying to encourage you here because I can sense the devil would come up on your shoulder right now and say, no, it's too late and there's no hope and there may be some things I've already acknowledged that sadly and cannot be changed, but you're still here and you still have who you have and don't quit on the thing. Be encouraged by the message. Don't be discouraged. Be determined by the message. Don't be depressed. So who is Noah? And what did Noah do? And what can we learn from his life? Hebrews 11. Are you there? Hebrews 11. And we're going to look at verse 7 again. Let me give you some biblical principles. Hebrews chapter 11. And I'm going to roll through these, but I do want the Bible to talk to you. Hebrews 11 and verse 7 again. The first two words, and together out loud. Help me, please. Ready? By faith. All right, let's start there. Noah was a man of faith. Everybody help me on that. Noah was a man of faith. One more time. Noah was a man of faith. Faith is awesome. Now, how do we know Noah was a man of faith? Well, his story is included in Hebrews 11, and we often call this the hall of faith. But I want you to notice verse 7. Here's how we know it was faith. By faith, Noah being warned of God of things not seen as yet. So what is that talking about? It had never rained. And God said to Noah, Noah, it's going to rain. There had never been a flood. And God said, Noah, there's going to be a flood. Now, what would you have done with that if you had never seen rain? And oh, by the way, Noah, I want you to build this big boat because there's going to be so much rain, which you've never seen before, that there's going to be a flood, which you've never had before. And I want you to spend this incredible amount of time and resource to build this giant boat. And you're going to put two of every kind of animal in the boat before I send the rain and the flood. And you're there like taking notes. Okay, rain. God, tell me again, what is rain? Where is it's going to come from the sky? And the water's going to be not just in the lake or in the ocean. It's going to be in my backyard. That's what you're telling me. What would you have done? Noah, you're not going to do anything else from here on out for the rest of your life. Well, I should say at least over the next number of years that God gave him before the 120 were up. When at whatever point he got these instructions. We don't know exactly, but it was a long time for sure to build that boat. And basically, you're not going to go do a normal job. You're just going to build this boat. And while you're building, you're going to be preaching. 
you're going to tell everybody about this rain you've never saw and this flood that's never happened before. Come on, y'all sitting here looking back on the story. Put yourself in Noah's shoes. You're going to tell all your neighbors about this thing called rain. You're going to tell all your neighbors about this. It's like us talking about the second coming. What are we talking about? But here's what Noah did. He believed God. You know what will help to get your family on the ark? When we actually believe what we say we believe. When we actually become people who are people of faith. Look in verse 1. Now faith is the substance of things hoped for. Please notice that. Substance. It's like you can hold it in your hand, but you don't really because it's not there. It's a faith thing. Hope is not like a hope I win the lottery. Hope is a confident expectation in God. Faith is so real to me that these things that I don't have are like I can hold them in my hand because I'm believing in God. For instance, Christ is coming again. There's whatever number of people say, you people are off your rocker. You think a man that was put in a tomb 2,000 years ago is going to come back to earth? I don't think so. I know so based on the authority authority of God's word. So it's the substance of things hoped for. And I want you to notice it says, talk to me, the evidence of things. Uh, did you hear yourself say those words? The evidence of things, what? Not seen. And in verse seven, Noah was told by God about things, what? Not seen. So faith is described as the evidence of things not seen. And Moses believed in, I'm sorry, Noah believed in something that was not seen. So it's proving Noah was a man of faith. Question, are you a man of faith? Are you a woman of faith? And do you demonstrate faith in such a way that your family is convinced that you're convinced about the truths of the word of God? We don't need to be people that are full of fear. We need to be people who are full of faith. And that's essential. And that's important. And all he needed was this word from the Lord. Now, think about it, what I just said. He had a word from the Lord. What did it say? I just, uh, verse seven here. By faith, Noah being warned of God. Is everybody okay with calling that a word from the Lord? He was warned of God. God said, Noah, this is what I'm going to do. Hey, Noah was warned of God and it gave him faith. Here, please put your eyeballs here. Look at this. I have the word of God and it gives me faith. Just like God spoke. Well, I'll tell you, if God told me with, a, with, with his own voice, I'd really be convinced. Hey, this book is the word of God. Romans 10, 17. So then faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God. We're not a bunch of crazies. We're not part of a cult. There's no such thing as Christo-fascism. We are Bible-believing Christians, and all of what we believe in practice is based upon the authority of the Word of God. We'll walk into federal court on Tuesday and be there, and our lawyer will speak, and we've got all of it out there where we're making a statement that for us to not go to church, it would be sin. You say, but Ty, why is that? Because we believe the Bible. And God said, not forsaking the assembling of yourselves together. It doesn't matter what the world does. It doesn't matter bluntly what the judges say. We must obey the word of God because we're people of faith. Are you a man or woman of faith to where your people, your family, they know they know that you believe this book. You know, the devil's attacking the mind of the next generation to try, watch this, to try and make, to try to make them think that their parents are crazy. Oh, you've seen this more and more and more. You've seen this more and more and more. The, a, a percentage and not all the public school teachers are liberal. We've got some sitting in this room. But whatever percentage of them, they're, they're not hiding. Why? They've been emboldened. By the insanity of the past two and a half years in particular, they've been emboldened. They are targeting your kids. They think you're in the way. They don't even have to tell you anything as a parent. They'll just do whatever they want at that schoolhouse. Well, that's a little overstatement. Not much. 
but okay, I'll give it. It's a little bit of an overstatement. You won't believe, can't, I had somebody show me with my own God-given eyeballs where a student counselor is saying about a certain student that if, if, if they're around, you have to use the pronouns they want and you can't inform their parents. And be careful when you communicate to the parents that you're not giving away the fact that they're now a different person at school than they are at home. You say, what is that? Indoctrination. And, and trying to take people, young people, it's child abuse is what it is. And I'm, I'm off point. We could be here a little while. Y'all, I hope you had breakfast. Here's the thought. Listen to me. We, we who are living in a crazy world. And there's one thing that can cut through the lies of this world for your children in this next generation. It is the truth of the Word of God. Because the Word of God is quick and powerful. And I don't care if there's more of them. I don't care if they have the internet. I don't care if they got the best media resources. If they package it designed for kids, you hear me, you stick with the old black book. And it'll cut through and bring light to their minds. But we better live like we believe it. Light that comes from the word. You know, that's what pleases God. Are you there in Hebrews 11 and verse 6? Without faith, it's impossible to please him. Impossible. Strong statement. So Noah was a man of faith and we know that. Next, please notice, go to Genesis 6. You kept your marker? Sure. Genesis 6. I thought you were done. Uh Uh-uh, we're still rolling. Genesis 6. Verse 9. Genesis 6 and verse 9. I want you to notice the last statement. I would imagine you have it marked. If not, please do. If it's your habit to mark or underline. Genesis 6, 9, the last words here. Noah walked with God. Oh, I love that. What a statement about the man of God. Noah walked with God. You say, Brother Todd, did he have an elevator? Did he have an escalator? How did he make it up to be walking with God? Listen, while on earth, he walked in the heavenlies. Say, well, what did he do? Well, he had communication with God. We would call that prayer. Do you know you can walk with God? Do you know what the next generation, you know what your tribe, you know what your people, you know what your family... You know what they need? They need a dad, the kids do, need a dad and a mom that walks with God. You need to be the uncle, the aunt that walks with God. Come on. For the next generation of these young people that are riding in on our buses, and if their parents aren't here, God give us some bus workers who walk with God. We need some Sunday school teachers who walk with God. I'm talking about It's a no-brainer. It's a definite thing. It's evident and obvious. I remember what it was like at the Clark house before my parents were saved. I'm the oldest, and I can remember plenty. For enough money, I'll tell you a story. No, I won't. Uh, (laughs) It was not just all wonderful. Now, they were doing what they could, dad and mama's parents. But on Sunday, listen, my dad, he was taking me Remember the back of the pickup? That's where we go to Gisborne, the little playground there. And some of you know where I'm talking about. And, and there in Gisborne, they had the little merry-go-round thing. And my father would swing me around until I went flying off. And that's what happened, right? It messed with me. And, 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 and Sunday was playground day. With mom, Sunday was Berlin auction day. I don't mean when they had the nice little tables you rent it and all that, man. There was blankets out there. And it was ungodly. We'd be out there for hours and hours. My mother would bargain, you know, my grandmother, you know, she'd say, what do you think? This is strawberries out here. You know, she would just go back and forth. Some of you, what's that? Check it out if you're not from here. Strawbridges, ancient South Jersey, Philly history. Hey, listen, listen. Life was good in the sense of she bribed me with a root beer snow cone and a Berlin auction saw pretzel. Can I get a witness right there? Hallow, did you feel that right there? That's the, if you're new to the area, Berlin auction, salt pretzels. If I'm getting anybody from the auction watching here, listen, advertisement. Hey, my mom walked in yesterday. She, she got out of the car yesterday. She said, here, I saw that white bag. I know that white bag. I've seen that white bag before. And she, I said, she said, here's pretzel. I said, for dad? She said, no, for you and dad. And there was five left because she ate one out of that half dozen. And they were hot. Oh, you can feel the Berlin auction saw pretzels heat come through that white bag. And it's like, it's like the manna that came from heaven. 
and I'm there. I walk up the stairs to give it to my dad. He's like, these things are going to make me fat. I don't need these. I don't need all these. I guarantee he did. I guarantee there's salt all over that office right now. (laughs) Absolutely. So we live doing what we did. But thank God for the day when Jesus came to the Clark House. Thank God. Because then it wasn't just, come on, Brother Joe, then it wasn't just about hunting and trying to be a good dad and going and taking me to the playground or taking me to work so I could help spot nails at the drywall place. Come on. And it wasn't just about mom and we're going to go down to the auction or go do something. Thank God my parents got saved and they got in church and they started to walk with God. There's songs about my mother's Bible. Well, let me just go on record. For me, by the grace of God, that's a real thing. Because my mother devoured the word of God when she got saved. I mean, it was an everyday thing. Her Bibles are marked up and she was in the Bible and I'd see her on her knees and my dad would do drywall and he'd come home at night and didn't matter how late it was, how tired he was, he's sitting on the couch and he was there reading the word of God. He never went to Bible college and he's pastor of this church. Say, where'd he learn the Bible? As a layman, are you listening? Sitting on the couch, man, as a dad, going out and doing drywall. But at night it was Bible time. And I knew my parents walk with God. I'd come in in the morning, my father would be laying on the bed, had the pillow over his head because all the family noise, small house. And I knew he was talking with God. God, give us a generation of children and teenagers that get to know some adults who they know walk with God. Do your kids know you walk with God? Shut the TV off. Pull your face out of the phone and the computer and get on your knees and walk with God in prayer and read your Bible. This is serious business, the saving of our houses. It's not time to play. It's like the days of Noah. God's people ought to be on the alert. Make sure everybody's on the ark. He walked with God. Maybe, Genesis 5, 24, maybe he walked with God because he knew his great-grandfather walked with God. You ever heard of Enoch? And if you're in your book, it's Genesis 5, 24, Enoch walked with God. But he had an ultimate great-grandson who also walked with God. Hey, I don't know how long I'll live. Maybe I'll the widow maker and kick off right here uh, in this, right here on this preaching box. My wife will be gone for the next year on a cruise. If you'll be looking for her, she'll stay as long as the funeral and then her and Rocky are out. She already told me. Insurance money, I'm a year-long cruise. Me and Rocky, we're just going to sail the seas. If I kick off and my grandson Michael grows up and the baby in Vanessa's womb grows up, I hope that I would have the testimony that I had, these kids would have a grandfather that walked with God. Do we? No, I'm serious. I'm, I'm not here to condemn you, to judge you. I want a good for man to examine himself. I'm preaching to me. Nowhere to hide. I'm preaching to me. My wife knows if I have a walk with God or not. Your spouse knows if you have a walk with God or not. Your kids know if you have a walk with God or not. How are we going to have the saving of his house, the saving of our house, if our walk with God's not strong? Noah had it. Noah took it seriously. God give us some great grandfather types who for posterity's sake, you'd have the testimony that you walk with God. Quickly, Hebrews 11. Noah, look verse 7, by faith Noah being warned of God of things not seen as yet, notice this, moved with fear. Moved with fear. And you say, oh, brother child, hold on, you just said he was a man of faith. This isn't fear in the wrong sense. This is fear in the right sense. You say, well, how do you know that? Well, because this is the Hall of Faith chapter. Everybody here is being applauded for their faith. I'm not saying Noah didn't have butterflies about the idea of what, you know, I mean, if he built that boat, 
Don't you think you went over it a few times? Make sure there are no leaks. Right? I mean, you, you have to figure they're doing that pitch. Seth, Sham, Ham, Japheth. Seth's on the front row. Sham, Ham, Japheth. Hey, one more round around the boat. Make sure, get up on that ladder. That looks like that could eventually become a leak. They were making sure. In that sense, I'm sure. But here's the point. Move with fear is the idea he feared God. He reverenced God. He respected God. He stood in awe of God and it moved him to obey God. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. You know what wisdom is? It's when we find out what the word of God says to do and then we do it. Pastor said it this way. Wisdom is the application of biblical principle. So Noah here moved with fear. Noah here was somebody that feared God and it caused him to then be moved to obey God. To obey God. Notice what he did in verse 7. Moved with fear. Fear prepared an ark. So he did what God said because he feared God. I want to ask you a question. Do you fear God? Do you fear God? Say, Brother Ty, I wouldn't be in church if I didn't fear God. Okay, let's go. Can I ask you to another level? How much do you fear God? How much do you fear God can be answered by how much do you obey God? Genesis 6, you're there. Genesis 6. And don't ask me why I don't have two markers up here. Genesis chapter 6 and pick up, if you would, verse 13. And God said unto Noah, the end of all flesh has come before me. For the earth is filled with violence. How's that sound like? Your evening news? Do we do that anymore? Your news sites, right? Filled with violence through them and behold, I will destroy them with the earth. Here he goes. Instructions. Ready? Make the an ark of gopher wood. Go for wood. Room shalt thou make in the ark, and shall pitch it within without the, with pitch. He goes through. He gives instructions about the details about how to build the ark. He talks about the animals uh, down in verse 19 and 20. Two of every sort. Fowls it to their kind. Verse 20. Uh, all the food. Verse 21. Gather it. It should be food for thee and for them. 22. Thus did Noah, according that some according to some that God commanded him. No, help me, church. According to all. This side over here is responding well. Over here. Y'all wake up over here. According to what? All that who? God did what? Commanded who? Him. So did he. Y'all to mark, circle, underline that word all. Not partly. All. Notice chapter 7 and verse 5. And Noah did according unto all that the Lord commanded him. He was moved with fear and he did not think, well, I think God will just let me go on this one part of it. I don't think that's as big of a deal. And Noah did not look at his living for God as a buffet line to where I'll take some of this, but I don't really want that part of it. No, he did what God told him to do. Do we? Do we? Partial obedience is disobedience to God. Partial obedience is disobedience to God. Partial obedience. Say, how many times are you going to say that? Well, it's important. Partial obedience is disobedience to God. So we want to make sure we are completely obedient. Why? Therefore to him that knoweth to do good and doeth it not to him it is sin, fear God and keep his commandments, Ecclesiastes 12, 13, for this is the whole duty of man. You know where to fear God? Please hear me. If you're only going to do some of what God says, don't be surprised when they follow that pattern. If you're only going to do some of what God says, When you know all of what God said, then don't be surprised if others follow that pattern. So could we say it this way? Noah, we might need some help back there. One of the little ones, if somebody could help me on that. Maybe we got the the, the aisle, uh, the uh, main lobby, if, if we could, that would be good. 
If we got a little bit of, of somebody a little restless, that'd be all right. We can help out. Noah, please look at 2 Peter 2. Would you turn there, please? 2 Peter chapter 2. And, um, and sometimes the little ones get restless because I preach too long and I shout a lot. So they want to shout back at me. I don't blame them. Oh, that's our good man here. No, no, he's okay. We're all right. Yep, if we got, if, if he's got, we're, we're fine. Let's do whatever we need to do. I'm sorry. Second Peter chapter two. But Chad, make sure he can hear me. Good man. All right, Second Peter chapter two. Second Peter chapter two and verse five. Second Peter chapter two. You know, God loves everybody and I'm so glad for the young people and children of this church. Second Peter chapter two and verse five. Second Peter chapter two and verse five. Notice this. Are you there? Everybody still with me? How many of you know God wants you to get what we got right here? Right now, listen, so please don't go drifting off into lunch mode. Second Peter chapter 2 and verse 5. And spared not the old world, but saved Noah, the eighth person. And then would you read this description of Noah? Ready? A preacher of righteousness. A preacher of righteousness. I don't want you to forget that one word in particular. A preacher of what? Righteousness. Now, jump to Genesis 7. You're close because you had it at 6. Genesis 7 and verse 1. Notice what the Bible says. And the Lord said unto Noah, Come thou and all thy house into the ark, for thee have I seen what? Righteous. Now, he was a preacher of what? Righteous. So did he preach righteousness, yes or no? But do we see here in chapter 7 and verse 1, did he live righteousness? Hey, your walk talks... And your talk talks, but your walk talks louder than your talk talks. All right, hit that again, Brother Charlie. Here we go. Your walk talks and your talk talks, but your walk talks louder than your talk talks. So Noah was not just do as I say. Noah was do as I do. You know what I've seen? A lot of Christian teenagers get frustrated about through the years if they felt like their parents were being hypocrites. Or if they themselves were trying to follow the Lord, they could hear the same preaching as their parents were hearing and they were trying to go and serve God and they end up having to go further than their parents because their parents were causing a stop at some point and they knew that they needed to keep going. Hypocrisy angers young people. I, 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 don't, I don't know a lot about a lot of things, but I, by God's grace, I've worked with thousands of young people for a long, 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 long time. And I'm telling you, I'm warning today, if you don't mind. If young people hear the word of God preach and they can hear it and they know it's true. And they watch as parents don't bother to obey all like Noah did the word of God. That's provoking your children to wrath. Well, listen, you're going to go to that school and you're going to this and that and the other. And when you're with those youth department and, you're, and they end up having two lives while in church. I say while in church. Because people have this idea, well, I don't really need to dot my I's and cross and T's because that's what the youth pastor's for. Oh, I'll tell you, Brother Michael, and he's after it, and Brother TJ, he's wanting them on the bus route, and then they get to go and be part of the Christian. Hey, listen, I'm going I'm to be really direct right now. It's not their job to raise your kid. We're here to assist the home. We don't own kids. It's up to the dad. It's up to the mom. And the dads and moms have to obey God's word. Now, I'm not here to tell you all of what that means for you when it, when it comes to some of the practical outliving of it in your lives. But this book is pretty black and white. And we need to be obedient to the word of God. So he did what was right. I'm going to read through. It's 1157. Y'all hang in for eight minutes. There's no trap door. I don't fall through. Nobody's making me say that. But I, 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 want, to, I want to kind of just pick up the pace and give you some of these last thoughts. Can y'all hang with me on that today? All right, here we go. Noah, chapter 6 and verse 9, Genesis was a just man and perfect in his generations. So Noah did right. He was not sinlessly perfect and neither will you be. And later on, sadly, post-ark trip, Noah messed up. But especially in, in the time leading up to the saving of his house, he was spiritually mature and pursued obedience to God and practiced what he preached. In Hebrews 11 and verse 7, Noah's doing right proved the world was wrong. Because by what he did, the Bible says he condemned the world. 
And I want to go on record right here. If you'll live the Christian life the way it should be, your family will be stand out and the way you live will bring condemnation on the way people shouldn't be living. And I don't mean in a judgmental way, but I mean, it will be obvious. Chapter six and verse eight, please don't miss this. And if it's not underlined, you'll want to get this one. The Bible says Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. Would you look at that? Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. How many of you glad for God's grace in your life? How many of you glad even as you hear this message and think, man, I wish I had done better. I should have done better. Aren't you glad we still serve a gracious God who loves us and where we're at? And he's the God of the second chance and the third. Ch Come on. I know I need that in my life every day. How many of you glad for God's blessings that we don't deserve and we enjoy for our family and our church family? Look at us. We're a mess. Yes, we are. Come on. I know you clean up well and come in here, you know, like you got it all together, but you don't. Hello. Come on. And neither do I. Ain't that right, Mark? Come on. The idea would be this. Listen, hey, we're needing God's grace in our lives. Thank God for grace. And that's where some of you are going to get discouraged if not careful. God's a gracious God. You say, well, what did he do? Look at Genesis 7, 16. God protected Noah and his family. Brother Charlie, the world's crazy. What am I going to do? How am I going to protect my kids? We're going to, we got a bunker. Brother Charlie, we're collecting guns. You should see it. But Governor Murphy knew he'd invade today. I got a stash. I'm telling you, I'm 12 feet underground and I've got an arsenal. And God bless you, man. And if I'm in trouble, call me over and put me in there. I want to feel safe. But here's the thought. Hey, bigger than guns, bigger than cannons, bigger than planes is big, big God. Amen. Safety is of the Lord. Here comes the flood, but Noah made it. Hey, it's raining out there. The world's going crazy, but God's in control. God, I got little ones. I, I, you saw me with Vanessa up here. Come on. Next generation, grandkid. But tell you, man, tell people stop having kids. I'm going to tell people to have stop having kids. You're crazy. Jesus might not come for 500 years. I don't know. And, and people freaking out about it. No, God's still on the throne. The answer is not stop having kids. The, 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 the answer is raise kids for God. Amen. Here we go. So he found grace. God protected Noah and his family. 614. Noah served God together with his family. I don't think Noah was the only one out there holding them boards up. Three able-bodied young men's sons, right? They were in on the action. Well, those poor kids, their dad drives a bus and he makes them ride on the bus. It's privileged to ride the bus. Well, you know, cleaning the church, man, I'll tell you what, it's free slave labor. Look at that kid. She's in sixth grade pushing that vacuum cleaner. It's privilege to serve God together. And I want to encourage somebody here. Please hear me. Get involved in the service of the local church and with your family. I don't know what needs to be done. Come see me. We've got jobs stacked from the floor to the ceiling. We were in here yesterday. I was, I was, I was cleaning the chocolate you dropped on the gym carpet after the concert with the bucket. And I had some teenage boys near me and brother Juan Carlos was in there and Zach Barsoni was in here. And what, what are we doing? We're, we're cleaning chocolate for Jesus. Come on. Absolutely. We had little kids running around here to putting up chairs. Oh, brother Tommy, that's just, you know, it's Saturday morning and we need our rest. I, I'm not against your resting, but kids eating more Fruit Loops and playing more video games is not nearly as good as kids learning how to clean up the gym after the, after the concert. Now, I know some of you are not convinced and that's why I'm on my knees right now and begging you because here's what I have found. Kids that are serving in the local church, one, they enjoy life more. And two, at a higher percentage, they're going to continue to follow God and get on the ark when you do. Is that all right? All right. What time did you say? 12.05. Three minutes. Noah found grace. Chapter 9 and verse 1, more children after the ark and continued family was part of the blessing of God. Um, Genesis 8, verse 20 and 21, not going to go there and deliver it all, but he built an altar. You know why he built an altar? Because he was thankful. And he gave sacrifice there, and it came up before God. Y'all remember that? You're there, chapter 8, verse 20, 21. You see him building an ark? You, you see that smell coming up before God, and God's liking that? You know what that was? That was a thankful, that was a thankful Noah. You know, it's an amazing thing. We beg, oh God, do this, do this, and then he does it, and we just walk away like he didn't do it. God, give us a church that can't help but keep singing, can't keep from not praising and walking around in a church where the shout has not died out. Amen. 
Uh, but Charlie preached, so that's why we didn't get out of church till 12:15. And you kids, you're probably they're probably going to be out of your favorite soup at the diner, and you know we're going to go home. And I probably burnt a rose. And come on, speak positive about the things that God. Hey, kids, we're saved. Yeah. Amen. All right. Ultimately, if you looked at First Peter 3:20, all eight souls were saved. Quote: Eight souls were saved. They all got on the ark. And the last point I want you to notice: Hebrews 11 and verse seven. One last time. Thanks for turning. Thanks for staying with me. I know I've been a little scattered here, but I want you to not miss this as the last thought. Hebrews 11 and verse 7. By faith, he was definitely a man of faith. Noah being warned of God, he had his word from the Lord. We have the Bible. Of things not seen as yet. And we don't know all what's coming. but We know we have the word of God and we can trust it. Moved with fear, not a wrong fear, but a right fear of God caused him to act and obey, and not just partially, but completely. He prepared, we need to be preparing, an ark, a safe place, to the saving of his house, by the which he condemned the world, and became, ooh, heir of the righteousness, which is by faith. But child, you think we're going to see Noah in heaven someday? I do. You think we'll see Shem, Ham, Japheth? I, I believe that, and their wives, and Mrs. Noah. Now, ultimately, watch, in their day, they built that ark indicating their faith in God, and they needed to do it to be obedient to God. But we only get the righteousness, which is by faith, by faith. Faith in Christ alone. Genesis to Revelation, there's one message for salvation. The blood of Jesus Christ, God's Son, cleanseth us from all sin. Air. Let me ask you a question. What are you going to leave your kids? Come on, home stretch, 1204 and a half. Air, and I do have teenagers, and when I say something like that, they start clocking me. And they send me screenshots. It was 1206. Air, we're in overtime, of righteousness. Here was my question. What are you going to leave your kids? You know what you can leave them? And I don't believe in a household salvation like where dad could say they're all automatically saved. But the idea of leading them into salvation that they can receive by grace through faith in Christ alone. You want to pray them in and lead them in and ultimately begging God that they would be saved in the sense of their soul is saved. Be most consumed with the salvation of the soul as compared to the safety of the body. I'm for safety in the common way we would speak of it. But the best thing is to be safe in Christ. And that's not by joining this church or getting baptized or by being a good person. It's only as that Bible says in that last part of that verse, by faith. Let's pray. Father, I pray that we'd have people in this church with whatever their family, their people, their tribe, and extend it where you give them influence. Lord, I pray we'd be passionate about the saving of our house. If you're here today and you don't know Christ as your own personal Lord and Savior, He'd save you from your sin. He'd save you from hell. You don't have to go to hell. Jesus loves you. Jesus saves. The question is, would you be willing to put your faith in Christ today? If you're not saved, you say, I don't know I'm going to heaven. I'm concerned about my soul. With heads bowed and eyes closed, if that's you, with heads bowed and eyes closed, and you don't know you're going to heaven, would you let me pray for you? I'm not going to point you out. I won't come to you. But is there anybody here, young or old, you don't know for sure if you were to die right now that you go straight to heaven, and you're concerned about your soul, if that's you, would you let me pray for you? Would you raise your hand real high where I can see it right now? I don't know I'm going to heaven. I'm concerned about my soul. I need prayer. Would you raise your hand and let me see it? And then you can put it right back down. Anybody? I don't know I'm going to heaven. I'm concerned about my soul. I don't know. Maybe you didn't raise your hand and you're here and you're not saved. If that's the case, there are men and ladies standing here up front. If your man come to one of the men, a lady come to one of the ladies, they'll take a Bible and show you from the Bible how you could be saved. I'm not going to ask everybody to raise your hands. But I would dare suggest every adult in this room, and particularly the adults, ought to be examining your own heart and life right now and saying, 
Am I doing all God wants me to do in the saving of my house? I know it's Jesus saves. But us doing like what Noah did in so many areas would bring our family to safety ultimately in heaven and safety here while on earth in the sense of us being in the protection of God. Father, please bless us. And I pray you'd help every person in this room to be consumed with getting our crew on the ark. And we pray for anybody here that's not saved that they would trust Christ. And we ask all of this in Jesus' name. Let's stand, if physically able. Maybe you come bring your family, your spouse. Talk to the Lord here. Say, God, help my family to be all that it should be for you. Why don't you come? Use the altar if you're physically able. Want to kneel, want to pray? That'd be a good thing. That'd be a great thing. Some of you young people need to decide now the type of house you're going to have someday. Type family you want to have someday. However God may have spoken to you, just respond to the Lord. Respond to the Lord. Say, Brother Charlie, there's just been a lot of messed up things. Well, start where you are. Start where you are. Do what you can. Don't let the devil discourage you, defeat you about whatever was not what it could have, should have, would have been. And just be where you are. Pray for your children. Those of you who have children, would you pray? Grandchildren, would you pray? Some of you have nieces, nephews, young people in this ministry you're working with, working on. Why don't you pray for them? Some of you have lost children or lost adult children. Don't quit praying. Don't quit praying. My sister-in-law, Carla, will see her dad this coming Friday. It's the first time she would have seen him in a few years. He doesn't know Christ. You should pray for Carla's dad that he come to Christ. You can't quit on that. You've got to keep praying. If you're here and you're not saved, coming to this church all the time is not going to save you. I'm glad you're here, but that doesn't save got to be willing to repent of your sins and put your faith in Christ. Why don't you come right now? Speak to one of those here that can help you. They'll show you from the Bible how to be saved and it'll be the greatest decision you've ever made. Get your family on the ark. Pray them onto the ark. We can't get saved for our spouse. We can't get saved for our kids, our family extended, our neighbors, others. We can do all we can to try and lead them to Christ. God can help you. Noah's a great example for us. Tremendous. Thank God for his life, his wife. Work on your marriage. Work on your spouse. Together be on the ark. What a blessing. No matter how much that rain came down, husband and wife were together. You say, Brother Charlie, this storm's just beating on us out here in South Jersey. Well, stick together with God. If you're struggling with addictions or stubborn habits, we have a Bible-based program, and Joel Patterson's standing there at the back. He'll be at the Welcome Center right after the service. You could see him there. They meet on Friday night and also on Sunday morning. It's a great opportunity, great Bible program. You walked in here today, and you don't have to wear signs saying you are, but if you are struggling with addictions or stubborn habits, I encourage you to see Brother Joel. He can tell you more about the program. Our junior camp is this week in Pennsylvania. It's for those going into third grade, through those who finished sixth grade. There'll be a meeting for all the parents after the service tonight in the choir practice room. 
I'd love for you to pray for the junior camp, that God would bless the little ones and that they'd have a great time. Bless the counselors, the workers, the preachers who run all of it. And so junior camp meeting right after church tonight. There's a singles activity coming up on Friday, September the 9th. And you need to go to solidrockinfo.org and uh, contact Damon about that if you have any questions. Damon, are you in the house? I don't know where he's at, but he'll be around somewhere. Check Welcome Center. We'll have somebody there. If you're in that younger singles age out of high school and up to 30, then you could uh, go to the Welcome Center to give you information about the activity. All right, how many of you glad you're saved? Okay. And uh, I'm glad that we don't need to live scared. We live by faith. And I know it's crazy out there and, and apt to get crazier, but we're okay. We're okay because we're in the Lord. Father, I pray you would help our church family. Lord, I pray you give them the grace they need moment by moment. Lord, we want to have families and marriages and friendships where those closest to us are on the ark. And God, I pray that you would give us safety in this ministry. Pray about our hearing on Tuesday. I pray it would go in our favor. God, I pray for Joe and others dealing with cancer and other health issues in our ministry. Give them grace. Help him with these scans tomorrow. Lord, we love you. We thank you most of all for Christ. We pray in his precious and holy and wonderful name. Amen. We'll have prayer meeting tonight at 530 for the hearing and pastor will be preaching.